maybe even before I introduce you, uh, we're using Riverside here. Is Riverside running on Erlang? Uh, hi there. Not that I'm aware of, but um, I think there are quite a few streaming platforms and frameworks uh, written in Erlang and Elixir, uh, which well, yeah, we, which can be used. Um, I think yeah, we were working with Uvu, uh, which was uh, yeah, number two after Skype many years ago. Um, all of the connections, uh, obviously, video streaming was being set up by Erlang, um, Cisco and Ericsson's uh, video. Uh, systems are all Erlang based. Um, you know, there is a membrane, which is a, a video streaming framework, which can be integrated, it, it is, um, is written in Elixir. And there are many, many, many others out there as well. So uh, at, at the end of the day, I think video streaming, all you're doing is yeah, instead of connecting two phone calls, you're connecting you know, a few video streams. Uh, so you know, the business logic is very much the same. That makes sense. Yeah. Before we get too far here, may I ask you to introduce yourself? So I'm Francesco um, Cesarini, the founder and technical director at Airline Solutions. I've been working with, you know, Airline, you know, back, you know, since the 90s, you know, the mid 90s. And I'm very fortunate to have seen a programming language uh, become an ecosystem of languages. You know, if you did, if you would have asked me back in 95, you know, if I was still working with Erlang in uh, 2022, uh, I would have said probably not, uh, but I still am. And uh, we're still kind of solving problems which uh, were relevant then and are probably even more relevant today. Well, wel welcome to our little unscripted series here. You said 95, mid 90s. Erlang is way older than that, isn't it? Well, Erlang... The language itself, I mean, they started working on it in uh, the late 80s. You know, what, what the computer science laboratory was trying to do okay. is figure out, you know, how do we program the next generation of telecom switches? And you know, it took them a few years. I think the first real fast virtual machine was, um, was ready in 91. And then 1992, they started mm -hmm. developing the first product, which was then released in 94. So I'd say 94, 95, you know, is when, uh, when it was ready to be used outside of the lab and it started becoming mainstream and started being used within some of the major projects within Ericsson. Okay. I was actually back in the start eighties, uh, but I was wrong. Uh, is it, is it coincidence that Erlang, I suppose this has something to do with Ericsson language or whatever. Is it pure coincidence that there was a Danish professor, uh, I think his name was Agne Krarup Erlang or something like that, who invented some queuing theory. Is there so, a connection here? There, there definitely is a connection. Actually, Erlang was named after Agne Krarup Erlang, uh, the Danish mathematician. So he was, you know, for those of you who don't know him, he was, um, he, he basically was a founder of uh, kind of tele theory, the tele telephony uh, theory. He created the Erlang formula, which uh, is the formula used to figure out if you know, all of the lines within a particular call center were, are busy at any point in time. But as Ericsson management were paying for the development of Erlang, they made Ericsson management believe that it was actually called, yeah, named after Ericsson. So Erlang, Erlang, Erlang. You know, so management thinks it was named after Ericsson. Um, those on the inside know it was named after the mathematician. Interesting. Interesting. So Erlang, Ericsson language, that's more like marketing. How does it work? Actually, what, what are the, what are, what are the deep secrets of the language? Well, Erlang itself is just a programming language. I think there are three things which, um, which when put together, give you, give you the secret source. So um, one of them is the Beam Virtual Machine. So it's a virtual machine which is highly optimized for a large-scale concurrency. Uh, it's being optimized to, to scale on multiple architectures. And just recently, actually, they've added the just-in-time, the JIT compiler. Uh, so that, that's one third, I think, of the power. The other third is something we called OTP. Uh, OTP is a middleware and a way of abstracting uh, from the concurrency models, which increase the programmer productivity, 
but also on top of increasing the programmer productivity, they hide all of the tricky parts of dealing with uh, full tolerance and with concurrency. So by using OTP and by using the programming principles, your, your systems will scale and you know, by default be resilient. And then the third is, I, I would not even say Erlang itself, but the semantics of the programming language, of the Erlang programming language. And these are semantics which most languages running on the Beam today, so including Elixir, uh, by, by default inherit. And you know, put, put those three together, that's when, when you get the real power of, of the ecosystem. And uh, just, just to quote Joe Armstrong, um, you can copy the libraries, which is you know, what's happened with OTP uh, in, on the JVM or in .NET and in many other, uh, uh, I've seen it you know, being copied in Java and many other um, uh, programming language ecosystems. But so you can copy the libraries, but if it doesn't run on the beam, uh, you cannot emulate the semantics. So it's it's the three basically put together which give you the full power. The, the semantics of the language are have a very tight one to one mapping with the operations of the virtual machine, and then OTP is built on top of that to facilitate and and hide complexity from the programmer. Okay, so the idea that uh, Elixir is the new generation of Erlang. That's actually not true. It's another language running on the same VM. That, that is correct. Well, actually, Elixir compiles to Erlang. And, and that was a choice I think Jose Valin did, uh, did uh, consciously so as to be able to utilize all of the tooling and you know, all of the tooling um, and libraries which, which, exist, uh, which exist in the Erlang ecosystem uh, when he went in and, in, in, and created Elixir. And so I, I, I would almost call Elixir a, a, a new version of Erlang with a slightly different syntax, different tooling, and a different development approach to, to what we are used to in the Erlang world. And by doing this, uh, by, by changing the tooling, by improving the tooling, uh, by providing a frameworks which were specific to, to certain types of problem, he opened you know, kind of the power of Erlang to a wide range of developers which uh, for which you know it wouldn't have been accessible otherwise yeah that's true because i have a feeling that um, that elixir is as you say it's addressing a complete new audience as compared to let's call it the original airline Cor correct community. yeah correct uh, i mean it, absolutely you, you're perfectly right there and he he did it. Yeah, he, he he did a fantastic job. I mean, his goal, uh, you know, if, if I always ask programming language inventors, why did you invent language X, Y, or Z? And when I asked Jose that question, um, his answer was, you know, I, it was I wanted to open up, you know, the power of Erlang and yeah, Erlang and the Erlang virtual machine, so the Beam, to a much larger, a wider range of programmers, uh, and. And more specifically, I think the first time I asked him that question, his focus was web developers. So how do I bring the power of Erlang to the web development world? And mm -hmm. web developers and Erlang developers, you know, it's telecom versus web, it's two completely different problems uh, we were solving. And these two different problems require completely different approaches. So uh, they require different toolings, different libraries, different frameworks. So... Uh, yeah, and that also explains why our attempts of trying to bring um, Erlang to the web, you know, failed, you know, back in, in uh, the mid 2000s. You know, there were a lot of web frameworks in, in um, written in Erlang, um, Erlang Web. I think there was Cowboy, Yours, Web Servers, but none of them addressed uh, the requirements of the web developers at the time. Instead, what they did is they addressed the, the, the requirements of you know, of those you know, developing telco infrastructure. How does uh, the fault tolerance actually work? The OTP. More than OTP, I think the fault tolerance. It's, it's a very simple uh, notion that you know you've got processes, and processes do not share state. They do not share memory. And so what that means is you can have many processes running at the same time. And if a process, if something goes wrong, 
uh, in a process. So if there's a bug in the code, the process is running or the data gets corrupted, you just terminate that particular process. And you, by terminating that process, all the other processes around it, which are not dependent on it, are not affected. So imagine that you've got um, imagine that you've got you know thousands of phone calls going through your system. Each phone call is a process. And if you know something goes wrong with one particular phone call, you lose that phone call, you lose that connection. The other phone calls aren't aren't affected, and so you know, that, that that's a core principle of processes and processes not not sharing uh, not sharing state. We then take these processes and we we group them into what we call supervision trees. So a, super, a supervision tree is basically a process uh, whose only task is to supervise other processes, and was when supervising these other processes. If a process fails, the supervisor you know, is immediately notified of it uh, and is able to react. And it can decide how to go in and, and actually deal with that failure. Could, it be, could we try to restart that process and reconnect that phone call? Or do we just ignore it? Or are you know, all of the other processes somehow, did it, maybe it was a group call and it was the host process which, which terminated and it goes in and decides maybe we should terminate all of the other connections you know, and then restart them. And by doing that, what, what you're actually doing is you're removing failure and error handling from the hands of the programmer and you're generalizing it. So you, you might have heard the whole let it crash approach. And, and that's what we refer to in the Erlang world. When we let processes crash, we don't mean that you know, we ignore failure or, or we, 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 we encourage it. It's just that we add and handle these errors in a slightly different way. And by handling them in a more generic way, um, you know, that's how we create this full tolerance. Uh, we, we isolate failure and then we escalate it only when necessary. And we control it, um, not, you know, we control it in, a central, in a central way, in a generic way. And this you know, greatly simplifies uh, the code base. Um, comparisons with um, Erlang and C++ code, where they've implement, where, where they went in and implemented the same problem in Erlang and C++, resulted in um, resulted well in the C++ code base. About twenty five percent of the code base was uh, error handling and fault tolerance. The equivalent in the Erlang code base was about one percent. So uh, there's a huge difference uh, in, in the code. So just by, by, by going down the Erlang route, your system becomes full tolerant, but you, you also reduce your code base by around 25%. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Uh, well, it does. It's like the, uh, that's like exception handling is just being propagated out to the bookkeeper. That is correct. Yeah, exactly. So we just pushed all of the exception handling to the supervisor and the supervisor yeah. handles it in a standardized way. Instead of letting the programmer deal with exception, because again, if you, ha you have an exception, you don't know why you got that exception. How do you deal with it? You don't, you don't know how to deal with it because if you mm -hmm. knew it wouldn't be there in the first place. So by generalizing how exception handling is, is, is managed, uh, yeah, you, you basically get rid of exceptions or you know, they could become a very, very rare occurrence. Akka, like Akka.net or whatever frameworks uh, there are. Yes. They're very much inspired by this. That is correct, yes. I think they come directly out of the Erlang world even, yeah. That is correct. So Jonas Bonner actually started implementing Akka when he was working as a consultant on a customer project and the, the customer wouldn't allow him to use Erlang to solve a particular problem. So he got so frustrated that he took OTP and, and the, the whole error handling in OTP and started porting it to the JVM. Now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think he did an amazing job at, at, at bringing, you know, bringing it to the JVM. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart because the JVM wasn't built for, it was, you know, J, the JVM was built for parallelism. And what he did is he bought lightweight concurrence and green threads, which used to exist in Java, but, you know, got removed early on to mm. the JVM. And it, it, it's, um, 
uh, it's almost like you know, th- when I was reading you know, the original Java white paper, you know, I-, I had a sense of deja vu, which was you know a virtual machine and a concurrency model uh, built in memory management and a garbage collector. So this was a JVM, and I was working on on, on the Erlang virtual machine at the time. And but you know, I think that there's still a big difference you know between the Java virtual machine and uh, and the Beam today because. To to bring Akka, yeah. you know, to to um, to the JVM, Jonas actually had to emulate a lot of the semantics and a lot of the functionality which exists in the Beam, which the Beam is highly optimized for, which doesn't exist in the JVM. Yeah. Yes. And all the protection. I, I, exactly. All the protection spaces around processes. Yeah. That needs to be replicated in, into a threat model instead. Exactly. So he had to create all of that layer. And even there, you know, I think there's, there's, uh, he wasn't able to fully create, you know, or emulate the semantics because, uh, you know, the, the, the actors have to yield. Uh, and so you're, you're basically putting that in the hands of the programmers. So versus Erlang, where your processes are get given a certain number of, um, of operations are allowed to execute after which they automatically get suspended and you know, the next process gets to execute. So you, you run the risk of, you know, of an actor in, uh, in ACA starving all of the other processes, all of the other actors. And yeah. that's not a risk you have, uh, on the beam because again, they've, they've removed that from the hands of the program. The program doesn't even know that, uh, yeah, that, um, yeah, how the processes are actually being scheduled and managed. And they shouldn't know. They should just program, you know, thinking concurrently, and then the rest is all abstracted away from them. Yeah, so now it becomes really nerdy and really interesting because like these, these processes in the beam, are they really processes like supported by the hardware, by the CPU? Or is it some middle thing between a... no? A real process and a threat. Yes. So what happens is when you start the beam, uh, it will start a scheduler um, in a separate thread for every core. So you know, assume you know, you're running on a quad core machine. Uh, it, yeah, the beam will start four threads. Each thread will run a scheduler. And each scheduler you know, uh, will have its fair share of processes. And uh, so yeah, assuming you're, you know, you're running, you know, you've got 400 processes, each schedule will on, have about 100 processes each. And then you know, there's migration logic, which ensures that you know, the different schedulers remain fairly balanced. So your processes might be migrated from one scheduler to another. So from one thread to another, if most of the threads on, on, on a particular, um, in a particular scheduler terminate. There used to be, I don't know if it still exists, but there used to be a, a, some project, some library framework called Lua. Does that still exist? That allowed you to act. This is this is uh, this is something for the audience here. That actually back then at least allowed you to run Erlang on an iPhone. Does that still exist? So yes, it, it, they still exist. It never really made it into production. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not aware of any you know a, any Erlang Erlang or Elixir development on iPhones. Um, I think yeah, that that's that's uh, that's a subset which was yeah w- w- that that's basically part of the market which I think was v- handled very well by by these technologies and again you know for the same reason as to why we failed uh, you know to get Erlang into the web development space um, you know at least us historically we were all server side backend systems you know th- those are the types of problems we solved so even though you you could develop Erlang on the on the phones. You know, the, the types of toolings and, and frameworks you needed were very, very different. I, I guess it goes very much against the idea of having a phone, but that's another discussion. It's like a client yeah. and, not a, and not a server. That, that's correct. But we're seeing a lot happening now uh, for you know, Elixir you know, making its way into an embedded space um, through mm-hmm. yeah, nerves, you know, there are graphical packages, which you know, can run on handheld computers and... So, and also you know, to the point where I think we were running um, Erlang and, and controlling the CAN bus with Erlang in cars probably 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, almost 15 years ago. 
but it's really now making it mainstream, you know, becoming mainstream now where you know, we're collecting more and more data in the cars themselves and um, in the cars and well, in, in all of the IoT devices themselves. And it's not becoming feasible anymore to actually go out and push this data um, you know, to, to the edge network and to the cloud because of the large volumes of it. So you actually start analyzing it uh, in the devices themselves or yeah, in some cases also in the edge network uh, where, where feasible. So we're seeing airline and Alexia being used in those spaces more and more these days. And I think with, you know, with the work which has been done on the JIT compiler, which has had you know, huge performance increases, uh, and the work which has happened with numerical Alexia, uh, uh, which is then enabling the whole Axon framework, uh, which is very similar to say to PyTorch. Um, we're, I suspect you'll be seeing machine learning now uh, moving onto the devices, onto the embedded devices, uh, in cars, in IoT devices, and to a certain degree also in the radio base stations and the edge networks. So I think it's still early days, but I think uh, there are a lot of exciting things uh, you know, happening in that space. And all of the components are are being put in place uh, for it to become uh, yeah for for it to become viable and uh, an alternative approach and technology for machine learning how much is uh, the erlang universe actually evolving right now if we could isolate plain erlang from um, from elixir very little very very little so um erlang itself at least the programming language um there are very few changes uh, happening. Most of the work, I think, is done around the libraries, the frameworks, but also on the Beam virtual machine. That's where I think a lot of the effort is going in uh, today. Yeah. But um, the language itself, I mean, Ericsson, who, you know, they're, they're, well, Sarah Erlang is open source, Ericsson is a benevolent dictator. They've always been very conservative um, of about introducing new changes. Um, for two reasons. A, you know, they've got millions and millions of lines of code in production. So any back, non-backwards compatible changes would have a huge impact on, on all the code they've got in production. But B, you know, if they start you know, pushing out new features, they need to support and maintain them. So you know, they're very, very careful o- over what actually gets released. Mm. But a lot of the... Um, work and a lot of the focus is on really making uh, the beam scale on multi-core architectures, making it fast, making it lock free. And you know, we're seeing, you know, with every release, you know, all you need to do is, you know, is, is actually go in and, you know, in some cases you don't even need to recompile uh, your beam code. You just need to re- rerun it. In some cases you might have to recompile it. But, you know, back in the days, you know, we used to joke that, you know, if your program wasn't fast enough, uh, wait 15 months and then you know, buy a new computer is going to run twice as fast. Now, uh, yes, yeah, it will run it will run faster the more cores you throw to the problem. But, you know, all you need to do these days is just wait for a new version of the Beam and, you know, recompile your, your airline code and it's going to run faster. Thank you. It's been, it's been fascinating talking about this and I think we could go on all day.